I do believe that we will be safer uh, than many of the grocery stores, despite the fact that they're pushing hard to get safe systems in place too. And part of that's that we're outside, that we can easily control access and, and uh, the environment in a way that's challenging inside of a store environment. What we have found is that over the last couple of weeks, there's been a pretty dramatic increase in people signing up for uh, with, with farmers directly for uh, coming to the market and pre-ordering. And that it's, it's good because the farmers that in our market anyway are, the vast majority of them are really dependent upon these markets for their year round economic viability. Without it, they're not gonna be in business. They're not gonna be able to pay taxes they're not gonna be able to pay the farm workers. So the farmers need a plan now. <laughs> they needed it a month ago because they're in the midst of their growing season already. In order to deliver spinach this week, they had to plan it months ago. They had to overwinter it. They need cash now to be able to plant seeds so that we can have tomatoes and eggplants in the summer. Um, None of these products that we can get locally are readily available in local supermarkets. Uh, I know that, for instance, I do a lot of shopping at the Hunger Mountain Co-op, but even there, I can't get the quality and locally grown produce that's available at the farmer's market. So it really is essential. I'm thrilled to hear Abby's comments that there will be some guidance coming out even late this afternoon we're ready to move uh, and implement as, as strategically as we can on Saturday morning and have what we're terming is a, uh, a market sponsored pickup location. Uh, we'd love to have face to face pickup as well if that's possible. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, Abby, uh, what do you think about John's suggestions? Uh, those things that you've already talked about or will have an opportunity to deal with? Yeah, so John, I, I do appreciate the, the update on what Capital City Farmers Market is thinking of. And I, and I know that, that your market has, has been frustrated at times with the information coming from our agency and, and I am sorry for that. Um, I mean, I, I can speak from personal experience having been a farmer's market vendor for many years as a producer, and, and I know the importance of markets to kind of build your customer base and test your products and grow your business. So I, I personally can relate to both, both you and the Capital City and other farmer's market vendors and market su support staff. Um, so I, I think much of what you're describing is is captured in this updated farmer's market guidance. I think I, I'm, I'm reluctant to give you quote unquote approval um, to move forward. And I feel like that information will come um, tomorrow morning um, once we have a final version um, approved by the governor's office. Um, and I think, again, this speaks to that desire for black and white and the fact that we're gonna function in a little bit of a gray area even going forward. Um, the Agency of Agriculture is not going to be in a position to approve or grant kind of permission. Um, the process is going to be, the guidance will be provided, it'll be clearly communicated, folks will have access to it, and the expectation is that people will, will follow the guidance and adhere to the expectations. Um, so we will, that's, that's the benefit of this, this next phase of increased clarity. Um, around what are the specific expectations. And there will be some individual market questions that are gonna still come up. And I think that between a conversation with Commerce and the Agency of Agriculture, we'll still have to do our best to clarify and interpret that guidance to meet individual um, markets, questions and needs. Um, so I, I don't expect that we're gonna unveil guidance because it's not 13 pages long, it's, it's one or two pages long, so it's not it's not gonna answer every permutation that every market is gonna have starting today through, through August. So it's really designed to just give guidance and information for right now, right immediately. 
and that may change going forward. We suspect that it will change going forward and it will, it will also evolve based upon the parameters of the stay home, stay safe executive order over time. So I know that's not the exact answer that you hope to hear, but it's the best, the best answer that I can give, give right now. Thank you. Yeah. Abby, I was, I'm wondering in many grocery stores, uh, you know, face to face, when you walk through the checkout, not that I've been there, but I've been told, did they put up uh, like plexiglass? Uh, and I'm wondering if, uh, if like John was saying face to face, if, if at the counter where they're going to have or be able to put the, I'll get you, Maddie. Um, where they're going to put the, uh, you know, the one pound bag of spinach, if they add a plexiglass up there so they really can see each other, but they aren't directly, you know, um, face to face, um, if something like that, you know, is already happening. And maybe, Maddie, you've got an answer to that. Um, yeah, we have some thoughts, and I uh, don't want to interrupt. I really appreciate the discussion, but I didn't know if I was still on your screen or if you can see me. Um, so yeah, we at NOFA um, have some specific guidelines that we are proposing that I think align really clearly with what John is talking about and social and we have very specific um, guidelines for that, including eliminating entertainment activities, children's activities, any seating for consumption of prepared food, that kind of thing, um, as well as some of those really, you know, strict social distancing guidelines and specific types of like physical barriers that um, vendors can place between themselves and their customers. Um, I think that these guidelines that we have put together, um, and I will say also that we really, we've been in close touch with the agency and really, really appreciate their hard work on this and their collaboration. Um, but we are continuing to push for a little bit more um, of a modified market in the way that John is talking about with limited person to person contact um, in a similar way that grocery stores are allowed to operate currently. Um, we are, I'm glad to hear that the agency is considering um, how to include access for SNAP shoppers in these guidelines, because that I will say is one of our biggest concerns with uh, this sort of online pre-order and curbside pickup model that SNAP shoppers are not able to use their benefits online currently. Uh, so that's really critical for us that SNAP shoppers are able to have access. Um, but in addition, we really feel strongly that markets can operate safely with these clear guidelines in place, which are um, much more in depth than, you know, just sticking to a, a online order and curbside pickup model. Um, but We've seen these markets working in other parts of the country, even in New York City, frankly. Um, the green markets are able to operate with this very careful, limited person-to-person -person contact model. And if they can do it in New York City, uh, which is really the epicenter of this virus right now, we feel strongly that it can happen in Vermont. Um, so I shared with the committee what um, NOFA is proposing in terms of these modifications, which are going to some pretty great detail. Um, and we would love to see markets able to adapt these guidelines you know, and, and if it feels like the best possible approach, um, submit those health and safety protocols on an individual basis to be approved. Um, and I also wanna share that we have a consultant on hand from the Farmers Market Coalition, which is a national organization to help us in supporting markets with this transition. Um, so we have some expertise available to help markets meet these guidelines. Um, so those guidelines are available for um, members of the committee to see. And if you want to look through them right now, Linda um, is able to put them up on the screen. I'm not sure that that's necessary. Um, but we do feel that this limited person to person contact model um, is possible. And we'd like to see that allowed sooner than later. Um, yeah. We just really feel strongly that markets are a critical food access point. And if we can do this in a limited, you know, careful person to person way, um, we don't see any reason that markets should be being treated uh, this differently from grocery stores, which I will say in my own personal experience, uh, 
I respect so much the work that grocery stores and workers and shelf stockers are doing right now to keep food available. But I will also say that there is not a lot of consistency across stores in um, what practices are being used. In my town, for example, um, there are not plexiglass shields and, and cashiers are not wearing um, gloves and masks. And so we're proposing that at markets, there are much clearer guidelines that all markets are required to follow. Um, I also want to say that as the parent organization to the Vermont Farmers Market Association, NOFA Vermont feels really um, strongly that we have an opportunity to do great direct communication with individual markets to share this these guidelines um, in ways that you know there may not be as um, as direct a communication line to all of the grocery stores across the state, for example. So we do feel like we have those communication channels um, and that we can ensure that all markets are, you know, aware of these guidelines and able to put plans in place to meet them. <coughs> Any questions? Well, sound, sounds good. Are there uh, questions uh, from uh, other members of the committee? Uh, Anthony? Yeah, you're on mute, Anthony. You're muted. That was Linda doing that, I think. Oh. I just, I just want to, you know, I think this has been, this is good. Um, I'm wondering, mostly kind of for Abby, I guess, because John and, and uh, Maddie laid out specific ideas, pretty specific ideas. And I'm just wondering, Abby, if you think that your folks are close together on what you think should happen. I know you can't say for sure what the guidance is going to say, but it does. I, I, the stuff that Maddie's outlining and that John outlined in a letter to us a while ago um, seemed pretty comprehensive. And I'm just wondering if those are things that are all on the table for you, Abby. Yeah. Um, so, Senator, I think I think they're on the table. I think the question and the difference may be around the timeline in which they're implemented. And what I mean by that is, I think there are probably be some stricter expectations for the immediate implementation for farmers markets that's that's beyond what John and Maddie shared. And I, again, I don't know if that will be in effect for through the end of April and that once market season for the summer time starts to really pick up in May that we can shift to that slightly more relaxed option. I, I'm presuming there that that's what will happen. Um, and so I think the hard part is going to be being comfortable with what we have for the immediacy of where we are right now and then and, and communicating that so that there's there's crystal clear understanding of what's permissible today and then making the shift once either the executive order changes or the guidance for markets and other businesses can be implemented that's slightly different than today. And I think that that when that will happen, I don't think that that any of us or even the governor or his staff are able to anticipate that quite yet. And I think it's all going to be dependent upon what we see around the, the COVID cases and um, and circumstances around the pandemic flattening curve. So and I know you already you already said this, I know, but um, once these guidance comes out. We will no longer be doing this case by case basis. Basically, people just get the guidance, and we'll, if they're adhering to the guidance, they can go ahead, unless they have specific questions that they want to ask you. Yeah, and and I think we'll we'll still welcome both at Commerce or at Ag the specific questions as people will have kind of permutations and nuances that that they are going to want feedback on, and and we expect that, and we'll do our very best to give again clear and consistent feedback. Um, I, th I think the bigger challenge is going to be, you know, if the guidance says prohibited person-to-person -person contact and only uh, pre-ordering for curbside pickup, which is my guess, um, that's different than what both Nelfa and John have proposed. It's it's not that different, but it is it is a slight <laughs> modification. But I certainly hope that you folks can work together on this and and get these uh, fresh uh, fruits and veggies out to our, our people uh, as easily as possible and as safe as possible. Are there any other questions? And Maddie, you got another one? Uh, yeah, I just, I 
want to add a point that I um, that I didn't include earlier, which John touched on a little bit, but I think I, I just want to stress that one of our concerns um, with the sort of online pre-order and curbside pickup model is just access for those tools um, to certain folks in the community who really, you know, are potentially at risk in particular ways. We're concerned that, you know, elderly folks or you know, have limited access to the internet are really going to be cut out of an online pre-order model. Um, and I think those are the folks who we're really trying to ensure have access through allowing this limited person-to-person -person contact model. Um, we definitely don't want to be supporting a proposal that, um, you know, places a greater disadvantage on folks without necessary resources like access to the internet, um, for example, to be able to participate. So that's just another concern I really want to highlight. Yeah. Uh, John, you had a question, but I think, Abby, uh, your hand was up first. Yeah, let me just, I just want to respond to what, just for further clarification again. So I, I feel that, that we're in a tight spot and that I don't have final guidance that I can reference right now during this call. I'd hoped that during this committee meeting, we would have been able to, but, but unfortunately we can't. Um, yeah. My understanding, though, is that it would not just be online orders, so you would not need to just have access to the internet, but it would need to be a pre-order. So you could have a phone conversation with a farmer, and you could even do payment on site. So that could be cash, that could be check, and that's the avenue that we're thinking should be able to work for SNAP and EBT cards. Um, so again, I, and people can, people don't have to drive up to the market curbside pickup location, they can ride a bike, they can walk there. So th there's other kind of um, assurances to do our very best to make sure that these would be accessible, this arrangement would be accessible to, to you know, most, if not all citizens or, or Vermonters. Yeah. Thank Bobby. you, John. Uh, yes. Yeah, is, is that Chris? Yes. I have a question. I'm happy to go after John. Yeah. Okay, John, you're up. Thank you. And Abby, I really appreciate, even though you can't give us guidance today, that the inference is there that we may, may be able to preserve some sort of basically pre-ordering on site, which is what we have in mind. And we won't have plexiglass, but we'll sort of do the six foot dance back and forth across a table that I think, you know, people could say that there would be a menu of items that are available. I could pre-order my spinach. I could pay for it. Uh, somebody could pick it up from the farmer, bring it to the table. I could then pick it up from the table. I think all that can be done quite easily and very safely and leave that option open to uh, farmers to sell additional produce uh, and customers who don't have access to pre-ordering or who forget to pre-order uh, the ability to to, to have access to that food. So I, I hope that's the way it turns out tomorrow morning. Thank you. Well, sometimes, John, you have to use your imagination a little bit. Um, so, uh, Chris? Yeah, Abby, uh, um, thank you for all the work you're doing. And, and uh, I guess in some ways, we're lucky that it's just the very beginning of April here. And uh, I'm, I'm hopeful we can sort this out for our farmers and consumers. Um, I, I'm struggling to understand the, the justification of how I can go uh, shop at a supermarket in a confined aisle, doing my best to keep away from people, but that I can't similarly walk around a, a park that has tables appropriately spread out and and shop that way i mean there just is a a, a real uh leap of logic that i guess i'm not seeing and i wonder if you can help us understand that to the extent that we're not treating these two uh food shopping experiences the same yeah um it's a good question senator and we're hearing that a lot these days so i'll i'll give a point but if steve collier is still on i know that steve has done a lot of thinking on this as well um i think one one difference would be at a typically oriented farmers market you're not able to have interactions with just one person, like one checkout person, which would be typically the way a farmer's market 
I mean, excuse me, typically the way a grocery store arrangement is that you just have one point of contact um, at your at your checkout. But it's true, there are other people kind of in your vicinity shopping, um, but it just sort of speaks to the nature of individualized transactions at individual tables at a farmer's market that's very, very different than um, a grocery store experience. So Senator Starr, I don't know if you wanna encourage Steve to share his thoughts on this topic as well as he's as he's noodled on it for a while. Steve's working on this too. Yes, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Senator, and and good morning. And as the lawyer, I get to come in and be the bad guy, so I'm used to this. <laughs> so I, I I do think it. I mean, Abby's done a great job explaining it. Everyone's points are are so incredibly valid, and I think it's it's helpful to have a little bit of the backdrop of exactly what's going on. And that is, and we all know this, but the whole point of the executive order is to keep people apart. And that can't happen perfectly because we still need to do a lot of things, including eating. So that, that is the principal point that sort of frames all of this dialogue is, is whether people are apart. So to the extent possible, the governor wants to keep everyone apart. Since that's not possible to do that, we have critical services that are defined. And when those critical services are implicated, then we do allow limited person-to-person -person contact. And so there's a lot of confusion about this, what it means person-to-person -person and whether social distancing applies or whether no contact. The only, re the only way that the, that the social distancing kicks in is if you are essential. If you are an essential business, then you are allowed to have person-to-person -person contact, but you have to employ all of the social distancing techniques that we're now familiar with that we never heard of two months ago. And you also have to telecommute whenever possible. So agriculture is absolutely essential. Agriculture is not being thwarted or stopped in any direct way. A farmer can produce and a farmer can sell. The market raises a different construct because what it does is it, it gathers people together. And it's a great question about the difference between supermarkets and farmers markets. And you can make an easy argument that there is no difference. One potential difference is that while everyone goes to the supermarket, not necessarily everyone goes to farmers markets and most people don't get everything they need at farmers markets. They also go to supermarkets. So there's at least the question, if you have an open farmer's market, are you creating an additional avenue for people to get food so that people are both going to farmer's markets and going to supermarkets and thereby increasing their exposure to other people? Another issue, which I don't know whether or not this has been a factor in the thinking so far or not, but in a normal supermarket, you don't have your farmers in the middle of everyone. In a farmer's market, you're introducing, by the very nature of it, farmers to the consumers, which we all, of course, in ordinary times want to do. There's a question about whether right now, when we're in the middle of a global pandemic, you want to put farmers in the, mid in the middle of the community, because that does create some additional risk for them, and whether or not that's something that you want to do or don't want to do, and I don't pretend to have the answer, but I think that's something that's worth considering if you're... If you're <laughs> taking farmers out of their normal place where they're fairly isolated and sticking them in the middle of everyone, whether that's potentially to their detriment. So, th I mean, those are some of the many issues that are arising, but, but also please keep in mind that when you can't have person-to-person -person contact, you can still do everything as long as you're not having person-to-person -person contact. And that's where the curbside delivery all of these other alternate mechanisms like restaurants doing uh, takeout and delivery only, like even if you're not a critical business, you can continue to function provided you're not having any person to person contact. And where a lot of confusion has arisen on that ground is the person to person contact is not only between business and customer, it's between employees. So if you have, you know, 15 people in a, in a, greenhouse all working to sell flowers like to, to homeowners right now the agency of commerce has asked people not to do that you can maintain your plants but you can't get 15 people together all working together to produce flowers to homeowners 
because at this juncture, that's not considered a critical service in the middle of the pandemic. Now that guidance is also subject to change, but it's, it's all very nuanced and it's difficult. And at its core, what really everyone is trying to do is to make sure that people aren't having contact with others unless it's important. Does that make sense? Well, it does, but maybe we could shut the supermarket uh, <laughs> down and just let everybody go to the farmer market. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, Chris, does that help you at all? Um, it helps me understand the thinking. I, I can't say I'm convinced. Uh, I, I really, you're, you're, you know, there are little Asian markets in my neighborhood. Uh, we let them stay open because they sell food as we should. And I, I, I think we're making a, a really odd distinction here um, of kind of what is quote unquote, the normal way of people getting food and what isn't, I, 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 I guess I, um, I, I'm not convinced uh, and I hope we can keep working on this because I think it's uh, a, a pretty important, especially given the pandemic. Yeah, it's very important. John? I, I appreciate also the the comments um, and I think it's curious that we're trading the health of agricultural workers in middle of California who are growing and producing and sending produce to Vermont for in exchange for you know keeping the farmers out of the farmers market so that they can be healthy. I think there's way to preserve face-to-face -face, essential face-to-face -face interchange without endangering anybody beyond what um, is reasonable. Uh, I just do. <clears throat> well, I, I think we want to get on to the community gardens uh, issue and, and whether or not that's going to be a, a problem uh, as we move forward. Are, are they, has there been any comment on Abby in regards to allowing them to uh, operate and set up or not? Yeah, so maybe again, Steve and I can can address this one together. Um, and maybe one last comment that I might make um, related to um, Senator Pearson and John's comments are that farmers can still sell food. And I think that's a really important reminder here that we're not saying that a farm can't sell food at this time, they absolutely can. I think the guidance around a farmer's market is more of um, some guidance around what the sale of that food looks like in a public location for pickup where there's other people and other vendors um, and other farmers. But we have great success and wonderful stories of farmers that are figuring out how to do online payment, other farms that are doing sales out of their farm stand or their garage or their front stoop um, to customers that are looking to buy product. And we recognize that that's not as convenient and that may be more of a limitation for the elderly or for people that don't drive or for some of the SNAP recipients. So again, I think there's value in having this market um, allowance with stricter guidelines but I do think it's really important to, to acknowledge that farmers can still, still sell food and consumers can still access food directly from farms. Um, so the community garden piece, um, again, I'll share a little bit and then Steve has had some communication with Agency of Commerce um, as recent as this morning. Um, we've sort of looked at it as it's a place where people can still garden and till soil and have their hands in the dirt. And it just may be something that they need to do while practicing social distancing. Um, and it's not really the jurisdiction of the Agency of Agriculture because generally that food's not being sold. That's generally food that people may be just growing for themselves, flowers, you know, food items for their own individual family. Um, but I think the issue has always been about wanting to limit that person-to-person -person contact. And if you're able to achieve that with social distancing, um, that, that that may be 100% acceptable. Um, the Vermont Community Garden Network has some great resources on their website. 
about how to do that, how to manage hand washing and practice social distancing and, and take into consideration public safety. Yep. But Steve, was there something you wanted to add or something that I missed? Uh, Steve, you're muted. Uh, can you hear me now, Senator? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you. Just just briefly, I think the bottom line is we don't know exactly the status of community gardens yet. You know, we feel that they could be permissible with social distancing. As Abby said, it's not really specifically an agency of agriculture question. And it's it's um I think the big question will ultimately be is is having a community garden, does that create a gathering? of 10 people so that if you allowed more than 10 people so would that be an issue and then the other question is and it's, i just don't think it's been answered yet because it hasn't arisen with any urgency just yet but we are talking about it is um is it a permissible reason to leave your home because underlying all of this there are outlined reasons why each of us can leave our home and exercise is probably the one that this would fit into right now and the question is, is um, gardening in your community exercise? And I don't think that's been interpreted just yet. Any other questions for uh, in regards to the farmer markets or community gardens, Anthony? It's not really a question. I just want to remind Abby to please send us a copy of the guidelines when you share them with others. Send it to Linda and Linda can distribute them to the committee. So I was going to suggest that I would like to be on the call tomorrow morning, but I, I remembered, I think the Senate's going to be on the floor tomorrow morning, believe it or not. So not 930, Anthony. Right. So even with all this Zooming, we can still only be in one place at a time. So I won't be able to make the meeting with the farmers markets folks, but I'd like to get a hold of the guidance as soon as possible. I'm happy to share it. There's no reason why we, we wouldn't. Um, sure. And I can send it to Linda. Um, and just for clarification, Senator Polina, the call with farmers markets will be from 8 to 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. So if you're feeling up and early and chipper and want to join before you're on the floor, that, that you're certainly welcome. Okay, it depends what else I got going on. I don't know about the okay. chipper part. <laughs> yeah. Um, any, anything else in regards to uh, growth? Yeah, I just want a clarification on the garden, the community garden thing, um, because I'm I'm looking at the guidance at the Vermont Community Garden Network, and Abby and Steve. Um, I know it's not generally under the purview of Agency of Agriculture, but I'm I'm still unclear. Uh, will there be guidance coming out? What should we be telling people? I I've been trying to share as much with my constituents through regular communications and but I don't wanna send them this link to this guidance on the community gardens network if it's gonna, if it's not what you are recommending or you're not sure if community gardens should be happening, what, what should we be telling people? Uh, Steve? Th thank you, Senator. So uh, as Abby um, pointed out, I, I've briefly looked at what the Vermont Community Gardens Network posted as well. And I think all of the suggestions are perfectly great suggestions. I think from the state's perspective in implementing the executive order, the question just hasn't been answered yet. So, you know, definitely if anyone is out in a community garden, they should be uh, practicing, practicing social distancing without question. That's something we should all be doing at all times. Whether or not a community garden that has 25 people potentially gardening simultaneously is something that's permissible under the executive order, just can't um, answer that yet. We do realize that it's an important question. And as Abby mentioned, we have posed it to a the Agency of Commerce, who's been working tirelessly trying to get out um, information. And I think another important thing for people to just think about is they're trying very hard and, and we're helping them in, in that endeavor, trying to not to be answering individual questions because we don't want people who have contacted the state to have some sort of advantage or disadvantage as opposed to everyone else who may not be directly contacting the state, but instead is reading the guidance. So what we're really trying to do is publish guidance that's as clear as possible. And it's never clear enough as we make up this new economy on the fly. Um, but we're trying to give people guidance that can be uniformly understood and followed instead of specifically saying to one person, yes, you can do this. No, you can't do that. And it's not that we don't want to, but with the number of businesses and people who are 
uh, involved, it's very difficult to do that. So absolutely, if you're out in the community garden, you should be social distancing. Whether or not that is a reason that the governor envisions for leaving your house right now, we're just not certain. Yeah, okay. thank you, Steve. Um, so I guess as long as there isn't 25 working in the garden, maybe two or three or four at different ends of the field, maintain their distancing, uh, they're, they're okay to go, Steve? As Senator, you know, I, I think at most right now, what would happen is if some local officer thought that wasn't appropriate, they might talk to the people in the garden. I, you know, I don't think anyone would be angry growing your own food. We all want people to be growing their own food. It's just that question of what exactly are you allowed to communicate, to be close to others with right now? And yeah. so we do hope to answer that question more clearly. But if people were in their garden two or three at a time, socially distanced, I mean, I, I, you know, I think that um, at most that would be a conversation to be had right now. Yeah, very good. Ruth, does that sort of answer your question? Yeah, sure. It's sort of, I mean, I think that <laughs> this is a whole, a whole new world we're all trying to figure out and the answers are not always clear. So that's, I, I get that. That's fine. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions in regards to... Uh, so the community gardens, and if, if not, in farmers market. Uh, yes, Maddie. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave you all because I think we're done with the the topics. But I just want to make a closing point um, in reference to you know Steve's statement about you know us creating this new economy. I really feel like I have to say this, and I I didn't because I sometimes assume that it goes without saying, but. I really feel like in this new economy that we are creating, especially in this crisis, it's very important that food security, food sovereignty, access to food, access to starts for people to be able to grow their own food, um, even if they are not commercial farmers, should really be centralized within the policies that we're creating right now. And that's, it's so critical to know for the mission that I would feel remiss if I didn't stress that point. And I think that's just sort of our overall comment um, on some of these policy decisions coming down from the administration that, all of these food access points, including access to home gardeners to grow starts, should be looked at as critical pieces of our food sovereignty um, that we take really seriously and really want to be preserving as essential as everything else. So thank you yep. so much. Thank, thank you. Uh